Welcome to the Startup Competitors Podcast, where we talk with early stage entrepreneurs to understand what information they use to inform product roadmap, strategy, and market differentiation. Welcome to the podcast. Today we have Carrie Griffiths, founder and CEO of Little Nugget. Carrie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Why don't we start with a quick pitch for Little Nugget? Mm -hmm. Little Nugget is a baby photo app that helps moms personalize, organize, and treasure their favorite family moments by turning that mess of the photos they have of their kids on their camera roll into something meaningful that they can save long term. What does that what does that mean? And I asked that I asked that partly as a dad who mm-hmm. doesn't keep tons of photos, but but then also like that sounds like that could be Instagram. Yeah. So, so so what does that mean? Um, in my daughter's first year, I took 15,000 photos of her. <laughs> Good night. I, it sounds like a lot. Because it is. It's a ton. But I t- you, you sit with your phone and you will rapid push and take 50 photos of one sitting and not go back and delete them. So when it was time for me to go and create her baby book for her first year, I was so overwhelmed with the number of photos I had to go through to the point where I just kind of gave up and walked away from it. And I knew there had to be a better way. And on a monthly basis, I had created a milestone photo that I would save on Facebook that I would share with my family and friends that had how many months she was and then just specific milestones that happened. So it kind of turned into my way to digitize the baby book because I didn't have time for that stack of baby books that was piling up on my desk. And I had a lot of great feedback from friends and family, friends who were pregnant that wanted to know what app I used, but I used PowerPoint. So there was that idea that there's not an app out there and it was something that I could try and build for other parents and be a solution to this problem. So what Little Nugget does is you can create different albums for each of your children. And as important milestone moments and photos happen, you upload them into the app. And so they're out of your camera roll. They're saved in a safe space. So then when you're ready to do something with them, they're there waiting for you. Why don't you... That's a good point to transition into current traction. Any vanity metrics you can share around the business to help paint a picture for where Mm -hmm. you're at? So we have... The app will be in the App Store for three years. The Apple App Store for three years this May. We have 22,000 monthly active users. Over 1.3 million moments have been saved in the app. And we have over 83,000 followers on across our social platforms. Um, we also were just featured last month as the Apple app of the day in the US. So there's only 365 featured per year in the United States. And Little Nugget was selected as one of them. So it was a huge accomplishment. And then Apple also did a Meet the Developer feature on me, which is more editorial on my story as a founder and as a female founder. All right. Now I have, can I, am I allowed to dive into that? Yeah, can you, can absolutely. That? I can. Right. Yeah. That, it's already out there. That's so. awesome. So, so do you apply to become the app of the day? They just pick you randomly. What is that? What's that process look like? I don't know how Apple chooses app of the day. They don't disclose that, but you can assume it's based on your metrics, your traction, how your app is growing. I, have been trying to be the app of the day since I launched the app. But what I did was last year, I went to the Worldwide Developer Conference out in San Jose, California. And during that time, there were the App Store editors were having meetings. And you could schedule a 15-minute office hours with them, as many as you wanted over the course of the conference. So I scheduled as many slots as they would allow me and got my face in front of the app store editors. That's amazing. You can't, you can't figure out who an app store editor is because they don't advertise that information on LinkedIn or online because they'll just be inundated with inquiries and comments. So it was my time to get in front face to face that there's a real person, a real mom behind this app. And I have a great story to share. So that got me on the radar. And then through participating in the Accelerator G-Beta. I got a lot of traction towards the end of the year as well with increased sales and increased downloads and recognition for the app. Um, So they reached out in January and told me about the Meet the Developer feature. App of the day is a complete surprise. You don't know that's coming until it happens. Oh, really? I was in my daughter's preschool drop-off line in the morning when I opened the App Store and saw it. So it was a total surprise. That's really cool. So what what was the impact of that? So if you looked at an average 
daily download rate in the three months leading up to that. And then on that day, or, you know, maybe even a the, whatever the trailing impact of that is a, a few days after. What 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 does that look like? Yeah. So the day that the feature for App of the Day, then also the Meet the Developer feature, because they happened a week apart. Okay. You could say the downloads were 400% increase on that day. And then the trailing, it trickled off as the days went by, but that content was still live in the App Store. But I'm still seeing impact from that spike in downloads because the app has in-app purchases and other monetization that happens further down right. the user funnel. And I would assume there's some network effect, right? So if my wife starts using the app and then she's potentially sharing with her friends and stuff like that, they're going to ask and right. So like yes. you get one mom, you, I would assume you, you get a network of moms. Yeah. Is that fair. I wish I had that statistic on for every one mom that downloads of it, how many moms they tell yeah, yeah. that I get. Up? That would be a great metric to have, but it moms talk about products and things they like, right. especially when it comes to making it easier. Yeah, the winning, to, the winning statistic yeah. is like, I have 98% of MOPS groups in the country or something, right? Mm -hmm, that would be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Then other recent things that you, you just mentioned, G-Beta, can you talk a little bit about what that program was like? And you mentioned you had some good numbers coming out of that from an impact perspective. Can you share that? So G-Beta is a non-equity-based accelerator that's part of the Generator Network. And they started this time last year in Indianapolis. They do two courts, cohorts a year. Five companies go through a seven-week program. And it gets you... It really helps you focus in on your story, getting your story together for funders, and also introducing you to mentors that can help bring your business forward. So you... On paper, it seemed like an interesting choice for G-Beta because it's the product had by that point probably been in the app store for two years, a little mm -hmm. over two years, and then and then go through an accelerator. What was your thought process there? I, I would think you would conceptually you would think like I don't need an accelerator, right? Like, so when the product launched in the app store, it was a side hustle that I had. It was something I started little nugget during nap times and after bedtime, so it wasn't my full time focus and. It started getting traction, but what I had in the App Store was just, it was an MVP, but users liked it and they really bought into it. So what I did about a year and a half in is I redesigned the app and started redeveloping the MVP. So the product relaunched in June of last year. So the timing for me to go into G-Beta was early September. So it was a good time for me to relaunch the product. I pivoted the brand to differentiate Little Nugget from a lot of competitors and Me Too apps that have been hitting the App Store. Um, so it was a perfect time for me to, one, get my story out there and be more focused on how I'm telling that story, but also kick off an effort for fundraising so I could really accelerate the growth, whereas... Up until that point, it had just been something I was doing on the side that was fun and other moms were liking. You said the, the key thing in there, which is pivot the brand for to differentiate against competitors. We're definitely coming back to that. Yeah. <laughs> but before we do that, I had one other thing I want to ask you kind of as a clarifying question. You'd mentioned you'd seen a spike in some monetization. In the pitch, you didn't really talk about that. So how do you monetize the product? What does that look like? So the app right now is a $2.99 download, which okay. gets you access to unlimited albums for your kids. And there's over 600 different milestone artworks that you can put on top of the photo um, that I designed. So for the in-app purchases, there's different categories. So, so you design, you code, you run a business, you I, fundraise. I, sell, I taught myself how to design. I taught myself Photoshop and Adobe. There was a week when I thought I could code it myself and quickly realized it wasn't my strength. So I I hire, hired that out. Oh, okay. Okay. Know All your right. strengths. All right. Coding is not one of them. Because you're almost like a superhero in my mind no. at this point. All right. <laughs> I wish I knew how to code, and but your I mom. don't. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. So I do the design and the business side of it. Okay. In marketing, I have found somebody to execute on the development of the product. Got it. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> I was imagining that. And I'm like, wow. Oh, okay. I got to reevaluate my life choices. All right. Actually, yeah. It's, I, so I run the business marketing side of it. I have a developer and a half working on the development mm -hmm. part of it. Perfect. So, Sorry about that. Keep going right. on monetization. Uh -huh. So 299 app download gets you unlimited albums for... Your, each of your children, or if you want multiple for your children, the artwork, 600 pieces of artwork that I designed. And then there's also an additional. So there's a total of 1,600 
artworks in the app to mark your child's milestones, going anywhere from first bath ranging to high school graduation day. So it runs the full gamut and you can unlock additional content for $199 or unlock everything for $599. Got it. When you look at the market and look at competitors, who comes to mind and it, that you don't actually have to name companies. You can talk in generalities, these types of uh, products, or you can name competitors. I'm good either way. All right. So when I think about competitors, there's a couple of distinct categories that I bucket them into. One is the iCloud photos, Google photos, those that's the um, competitors that it's already on people's phones. They're using it every day. To dump files. Yes. Yeah, it yeah. is file iCloud cloud storage where I differentiate myself from that is you are not making sense of your photos. You're backing them up. You're saving them. You might have a family album that you're sharing to grandparents, but you're not doing anything to take out those important moments that you want to go back to. That would be deemed in a traditional sense, something that you would print out and put into a baby book. There's also Instagram and Facebook, so more of those bigger social competitors where people are already sharing these moments. Um, what, I, Especially what we've seen in the last year is a move to privacy and not trusting those networks. So parents, one, are looking for a way to save those photos in a safe place in a more private way. But there's also a worry about oversharing their kids on social media because my daughter's four today. But when she's 10 and sees that I've been posting her entire life on Facebook, she might not be super happy about that in the things that I was sharing with my larger network. And then the final category is what I'd see is more of those direct competitors, those other baby and family sharing apps that are focusing on keep taking these moments out of the camera roll, saving them and turning them into printed products. So then is it that last category that you were trying to differentiate Yes. From okay, talk talk about that. What is the strategy there? So when I launched, I was only one of a handful of apps that was doing this child and baby photo preservation. Since it was a category that hit pretty quickly, and a lot of Me Too apps jumped on. A lot of those Me Too apps have disappeared, stopped supporting it because they didn't do it right and they didn't do it well. They were just trying to make a buck. But all of us were talking about moments and milestones. Capture your sweet moments and major milestones. So with so many different apps in the App Store, if you search baby photo app, everybody had the same headline. Everybody was talking the same way. So I wanted to, one, differentiate myself to stand out from those competitors, but also make a more immediate connection and emotional connection with parents. So then they're more inclined to download and trust Little Nugget with these moments versus some other apps. So that's when I pivoted from the moments and milestones to personalize, organize, and treasure because it really helps distinguish the three key things that we're trying to help parents do. Before we clicked record, you and I were talking a little bit about the difference between consumer versus B2B, uh, which you know we live in a fairly B2B focused city when it comes to product and you're not that. So I'd be interested, how do you get a feel for what your customer wants? How do you do that customer discovery today? Indianapolis isn't a B2B city, but there's a whole lot of parents in it. There's a whole lot of consumers in it. And I'm a parent myself. I have a do- I have two daughters, one who's four and one who's two and a half. So I'm a kind of, I'm a living, breathing consumer. So I know a lot about what I want out of the app, but I don't let that blind me with what features and functionality I push out because what I want may not be what the greater parent wants. So I do a lot of talking to current users and also other parents, especially when I was rolling out this new messaging or when I'm looking at rolling out and prioritizing new features, I get feedback from other parents and current users on what they really want out of it and where I should really prioritize that time. How far out does that feature roadmap go today? Like, do you have have years worth of like, yeah, we can just keep going. Yeah, I do. I have features that I wanted to roll out yesterday, but development doesn't always with B2B is B2C is the same way. It just doesn't go yeah. as fast as you want it to go. It never does. No. So so then as you look at those competitors in the space, or or maybe I should ask that a different way, how often are you looking at competitors in the space and comparing what they're doing versus your roadmap and how you stay differentiated and 
ahead of them or different from them enough to remain relevant. What is that? How, do you have a process for that? What does that look like? I'm a user of my main competitors apps. I like to, I'll use them at least on a monthly basis, some of them more frequently, just so I can understand the user experience, how they're changing things. But I'm also notified when they push updates into the app store. So then I can kind of check and have a pulse on what they're doing and what's rolling out. So far, I've been pretty strong on, I really believe in my product roadmap and where I'm going. So it hasn't, what they're doing, I don't let deter me too much, but I just kind of use it as in information seeking. So then I can make sure that I'm moving fast enough. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Full Stack PEO. Most founders start companies because they figured out a better way to solve a problem or serve a need, not because they love tracking payroll, filling out compliance forms, and explaining employee benefits packages. And yet, all that stuff still has to be done. That's why there's Full Stack PEO. Full Stack PEO specializes in turnkey HR for emerging companies, not just those core services, but advice and expertise that help founders maximize employee potential. Curious? Find out more at fullstackpeo.com. You're fundraising right now, correct? Yes. I am doing an angel round where I'm looking for strategic angel investors that understand the consumer business, understand what it is to manage and evolve a consumer product where the focus may not be as much on revenue, but user activation in the short term. And that investment is going to go to really accelerate my product roadmap to some big milestones that I want to hit by the end of the year. So then I can do a follow-on larger seed round. How do you find... And I'm happy to share some of my own limited experience in this as well. But I, one of the things that's really interesting when you think of strategic investors, strategic angel investors for any business is like finding that person who is actually strategic. And it's not somebody who's just going to write a 20K check, right? But somebody who really either has deep background and knowledge in what you're doing or some adjacent knowledge to what you're doing. So I would love, like, how do you do that when you go to the market and try to find those people who might have that experience that's going to be interesting to you that you can lean on? What are you doing to screen them or or find them and activate them? So for me, it's really happened organically. And I think I'm pretty fortunate at that. And the angel investors I'm talking to are professionals in the market that I've known for a couple of years now who have been good supporters of my business, who understand my business. Um, Some of them have also been new introductions that that have done work in my category very, very closely in my category. So I think I was, especially being the business that I am in Indianapolis, I was very fortunate to find some local angel investors that I think could really help move forward my business. And those investors who you got introductions to, so maybe you didn't have a prior relationship with them. Did those introductions come from other angels? Other, like, how did you, how did you do that? Now I'm specifically asking, because like, this is the, one of the hardest things for entrepreneurs. Yes. How do you find these people? It came through in, as a part of G beta, they do mentor swarms. So once a week you would do a power hour, basically of speed dating with mentors. And I would explain what I'm looking for an investor or what problems I'm trying to save right now. And or what problems I'm trying to solve for. And then those people would say, hey, I think you should meet with XYZ. You should meet with this person. So in any mentor conversation, I always went in with, even though it was, they may not be able to help me because they do, you know, agri science consulting, right? They might know somebody. So it's always going into those conversations and laying out what you need, where your challenges are, what help you need, because people know people and can always introduce you. Nice. Over the last three years, as you've gone on this path, you've you've mentioned G Beta. I think we got introduced through the startup ladies, right? Yes. I'm pretty sure. Well, reintroduced. I, I met you at one of the G Beta program things. I think I met you at Live Beta the first time. Yeah, yeah. Live Beta. Yep. So as you reflect on some of the either programs you've been involved with or groups that you've been involved with over the last three years, I would love, and maybe there, if there's any others you want to name drop or, or give a shout out to, I would love your thoughts on like which of those were most impactful at a key moment in the business and why and, and like you know why were they impactful what did you take away from that at that at that right moment 
I think of the organizations I've been involved in, I've been fortunate to hit them at the time when I needed it most. Um, I started the business in Chicago. So I was in 1871, which is a huge startup space. And I basically threw myself, I was leaving Microsoft, starting this business and didn't know anything about starting a company. So I threw myself into all of their programming and mentor networks and basically set myself to startup university while I was there. When I moved to Indiana, um, it took me a while to get ingrained into the Indianapolis community and what programs and groups were available. And that's when I found the startup ladies. I'm at a time when I really needed the extra boost and confidence in reinvesting in my business, redesigning it and pivoting it. And the startup ladies is so great because... It gives you the programming of how to run a business, how to overcome challenges, but also gives you a huge support network of women and men who want to see you succeed. Um, And then G-Beta, which just I feel like it just kind of catapulted me into this new stage of growth and re-energizing my business that I otherwise would not have had. Retracing the conversation a little bit in my head, I think you, you said three years ago when you first did it, it was a side hustle. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming you were in Chicago at that point, yes. right? At what point did it flip over to full-time? So I was at Microsoft and I had my first baby with Microsoft and they were very generous and gave me a six-month maternity leave. And when I came back, there were rumors that our division would be sold because I was in the media and advertising sales division. And about a month after I got back from maternity leave, they announced that they were selling us to AOL. Welcome back. Yes. <laughs> so instead of going to AOL, I knew that we had to move to Indianapolis in the future. I didn't really want to work. AOL still a thing? It's, Veri- it's Verizon. I know. AOL. I get it. But still. I know. Go yeah. ahead. So it, it wasn't, I wasn't excited right. to go work for AOL. So I decided instead and knowing that we had to move to Indianapolis towards six months from then, that I should take this as a great opportunity to take advantage of Chicago's startup ecosystem through 1871, um, use the severance that I could get by not taking the move. And and I invested that into starting Little Nugget. And it was just all a happenstance. I had the idea. I had wireframes sketched up. I had all the ideas of the features and functionality. So it was just kind of writing on the wall just to take the leap and try it. If it doesn't work, you know, a year down the road, when I get settled in Indianapolis, I can look for something else, but it was the time just to try. When you reflect on what you're doing today and you can take that however you want, that could be figuring out how to do fundraising. That could be figuring out how to do marketing for a product at a different level. That could be product roadmap, interfacing with the development team, any of those things. And you reflect on back three years ago, 1871, as you're just getting started and thinking about this. Like, obviously, I'm, I'm, you know, startup years are like dog years, right? Like, it's like seven years to every one normal human year. What are some of the things that you're, you look at and you're most blown away by like, wow, like this thing that I'm doing now, I, I never, you know, like one, I I always would have thought I would have to outsource this to somebody else or I never would do this or this would be the hardest thing. Turns out this is not the hardest thing at all. This thing's pretty easy. When you reflect back on kind of where you're at today versus when you first got started, what are some of those things that you look at and you're like, oh, like I'm like, I never thought I would do this. And I do this all the time or this turned out to be easier than I thought it was. Coming into starting a tech startup, I didn't know how to code. I didn't understand the tech speak of you have to have your product roadmap and you develop in sprints and this is an MVP. All that language was completely foreign to me. And I never thought three years ago that today I would be managing that product roadmap. I would be talking to developers about native iOS versus native Android versus React Native. And what are we doing with our AWS API? All of these acronyms that were completely foreign to me are now just natural language that right. I just had to catch on to. One, because I didn't understand it. But two, if I wanted to be a strong CEO and run the business, I needed to be able to understand these things so I could identify and lead a strong tech team to develop a strong product. So that would have been the biggest surprise because I have the marketing and the business side down. It was that tech 
stack that was the unknown for me. How did you immerse yourself in that? How did you get comfortable with, but particularly maybe some of the more technical stuff like React and AWS and, you know, like the, the different platforms that are available to you? I attended some meetups, <laughs> which I am not um, the normal person to attend those kind of, you know, React JS meetups. I also, of every developer I've worked with, ask an insane amount of questions. I think sometimes to the point where they're blue in the face, but if they say they're doing something, I want to know why. Like, what's the background? How are you doing this? What's the implications? And I think those are some questions I didn't ask in the MVP stage and realized if you don't do something right at this stage, you acquire so much technical debt as you go on. Um, So with a rebuild, it's something I learned that especially learning why things are built and how they're going to impact you downstream. That's just, there's no stupid question. Yeah, I would agree. What's the biggest thing you're working on now, personally, from an education perspective? Like what's the thing you're most excited to get better at? I, what I am working on personally right now is this whole fundraising. Yeah. It is a complete, I have bootstrapped Little Nugget to date. I own 100% of the company. So the whole fundraising world. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. But it's time to take on money to grow the business faster. So understanding the language and the terms and cap tables. So that is, that's yeah, my you, focus you right now. You just opened up a whole nother world of jargon, yes. right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Whole, exactly. So I'm, I'm me three years ago with technical on fundraising. So. Yeah. Awesome. All right. If people would like to find the app, what's the best way for them to do that? They can go to the app store on their iPhones and search for Little Nugget. They can also go to littlenuggetco.com if they're on Android and sign up for early access because we are very soon launching on Android. All right. And if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Through, um, I'm on Twitter. I'm at personally at Carrie Griffith. Our social handles are at Little Nugget Co. Or they can email me at hello at littlenuggetco.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you're thinking of launching a SaaS product, startup competitors can provide data on your closest competitors, survey potential users, or provide other product validation services. Learn more at startupcompetitors.com.